Welcome to the CIR Policycast, the show where we talk about current issues on the cutting edge of EDR. Today's guest is Ben Giaretta from Fox and Williams, and uh, he is a renowned dispute resolution specialist and current co-head of the International Arbitration at Fox and Williams. He appears as counsel in arbitration and often sits in as arbitrator, having been appointed as sole party nominated, presiding, and emergency arbitrator in over 25 cases. Mr. Giaretta specializes in the resolution of disputes in the energy and resources, construction, engineering, and infrastructure sectors. An Oxford alumnus, he also holds a postgraduate diploma in international arbitration from Queen Mary University, a fellowship with CIR and Singapore Institute of Arbitrators, as well as panel membership in various arbitral institutions like the SIAC, TSEAB, and VIAC. He is a chartered arbitrator and the chair of the London branch of CIR. Ben, if I may, on the show, great to have you on. Thank you. Great to be here. If I just jump into the first question right off the bat, would you mind telling your viewers a little bit about yourself, your professional background, and your career thus far in ADR? Sure. So I'm a partner at Fox Williams, um, and I'm the chair of the London branch of the CIR. Um, I started off as a trainee at Ashurst in London, uh, and I stayed in the Ashurst London office for 10 years. Uh, and I became a partner at Ashurst. And then I moved to Singapore, where I was for seven years, um, before coming back to London in 2016. Um, and during that period, I started out doing, um, at, at a very early stage of my career, working mainly on high court litigation. But uh, I started to be involved in arbitration work and um, that part of my career uh, became uh, bigger and bigger and particularly when I went to Singapore where foreigners mostly do arbitration work um, I was really it became an arbitration specialist there and that's continued since I came back to London. You're a known vocal advocate for commercial arbitration um, in addition to actually practicing it especially on social media and I wanted to ask you how important you think it is for someone who aspires to become a proficient ADR professional to make themselves visible by publicly weighing in on issues affecting the business and what you could recommend as a vehicle for doing this form of advocacy. Yes well I mean of course at the current time social media has become very important. Uh, I saw some statistics saying that use of LinkedIn had gone up by 2,000% uh, since, since March and, and since the pandemic hit. Now, whether that continues in the future, I mean, who knows? But um, it does seem to be increasingly uh, an important part of people's lives, increasingly important part of people's professional careers. So I, th I think it is important. Um, uh, now, of course, with any social media, there's a question you have to ask yourself, which is what, what are you really doing it for? What, what do you want to get out of it? Uh, and some people go on to social media and, and particularly we're talking here about LinkedIn because that's the main professional social media site. Um, you've got to think, well, are, are you using it for, uh, for learning? Uh, and there's a lot of interesting stuff on LinkedIn um, and it gives you lots of links through to other articles, other, other vi videos out there. So you can learn a lot from it. Or are you using it for connections? And people do um, use it to build their network across the world. Or, or and or, uh, are you using it to build a profile within the arbitration world? Uh, and as part of building the profile, you would also be looking to comment on issues that, that arise in the arbitration world. Um, I found it a, a very useful and effective tool, I must say, LinkedIn. Um, and I have built up some good connections across the world and I've built up a good network and, I, and um, opportunities have come along uh, as a result of um, my use of social media. So uh, I, I do think it, in, in today's world, it is a very useful thing to be involved in. Um, now, obviously, 
people can have very successful careers without any, going anywhere near it. <laughs> so it's not not the only thing that that you need to do, and it's not the only way to go about it. But it does work for some people. Building on the, the notion of networking, I wanted to ask also about networking, maybe in the more traditional sense of the word. Um, how much of a focus should that be for emerging professionals, and how important is it really? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, just take a step back from that. You think, uh, what is the arbitration profession, and what is the arbitration business? And it has grown up from uh, a relatively small number of practitioners, mainly centered in places like Paris and London and. Uh, New York, I'm talking about 30 years ago, um, uh, and it's grown up to be quite a broad, um, geographically broad uh, uh, business stretch across across the world, uh, and opportunities arise across the world, opportunities both for working on cases and opportunities for working in particular places, like by like myself moving to Singapore. So uh, I do think it is important to, in today's arbitration world, to build up your connections across the world and to build up um, a wide range of connections. Uh, and for that reason, I, I would encourage people to be, uh, think a lot about networking, think a lot about um, how they can make these connections. And, and part of that is the use of social media, as I've said, um, and that's particularly useful at the current time when you can't get out and about very much but it, it, it's also very important i think to get out and meet people face to face i mean um social media is actually quite a poor substitute for speaking to people face to face it's it's a it's a useful adjunct to it but what's really important is to speak to people face to face and um the arbitration world has developed various spaces in which um, these connections can be made, these net, this networking can, can happen. Um, most obviously the conferences that go on and also the various seminars, like the seminars that the London branch runs and other branches run. Forgive, forgive the plug there for the <laughs> London, London branch seminars. Um, uh, so I do think it's important to get out and about. I do think it's important to engage with people, to make connections, to um, talk to people, listen to people about their careers, um, and 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 find new opportunities. So, yeah, no, absolutely, I think it's very very important. I mean, um, just want to to get us back to what you said before about working outside of the UK, because I know, and as you mentioned, you worked extensively in the Asia Pacific, and I wanted to ask you what some of the key differences are between building a career, specifically maybe you know thinking about the legal one in arbitration there compared to here in the UK? Yeah, so as I said, this arbitration world has grown to cover the whole globe in the past 20, 30 years. So there's, a, there's an awful lot of similarities across the world. So the same networking is done here as in Singapore, as in, as in Hong Kong. In fact, now the major conferences seem to rotate around the, these, um, these centers. But at the same time, each each country, each, each location has its own specific culture uh, and um, its own ways of uh, people pursuing career paths, uh, opportunities within firms, opportunities within arbitration. So there's a combination of the two. I mean, Singapore, for example, um, is a very modern place I mean, and there's um, extensive opportunities to network and extensive opportunities to attend conferences and seminars, etc. Uh, it's also one of the most socially media aware countries in the world. Um, but if you've seen Crazy Rich Asians, I mean, that's, that's, that's the reality, their use of social media on that. Um, but on the other hand, um, it does have a structure of um, uh, training within Singapore firms. It does have a structure of well, the, the Singapore firms themselves. Uh, which is um, particular to Singapore. I mean, it grow, it's grown out of um, the English firms and the, the history of Singapore. 
uh, and people follow those career paths within those firms, um, which is unique to Singapore, while at the same time um, following this this broader path. So it's it's very difficult to say, to be honest, very difficult to make broad generalizations because there are these individual characteristics within each each uh, country. Um, I think one of the privileges of arbitration, though, is that people can grow up within that environment, in Singapore, for example, but then they may have opportunities to go to another environment. And in fact, there's very few practices within law that give you that opportunity. Corporate law perhaps uh, does as well, but um, arbitration lawyers are fairly mobile. So you could um, learn your craft in Singapore and then move to London or move to New York. Well, I mean, like myself, I moved from London to Singapore. And it's through moves like that that you really grow as an arbitration practitioner. You, you learn to look at things in different ways. Um, you learn that there's different ways of doing things. Um, so that's, that has been a very valuable experience for me. One of the, the major points of transition in the career of an arbitrator is obtaining the, the first appointment. And what do you suggest people do in order to get that first, uh, that first appointment as an emerging legal professional? Uh, well, again, it's sort of building on what I've just described, that it's very important to build your network, to build your profile, um, to be conscious of the uh, individual and particular characteristics of the place where you are and the um, dynamics for uh, appointments within that jurisdiction. I mean, obviously, people do get appointments from other parts of the world, but it, it's 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 pretty rare, I think, from certainly for emerging arbitrators, for, for inexperienced arbitrators, to get appointments from other parts of the world. Normally, they'll get their first appointments from the place in which they live, and so you need to be at, attuned to the environment for appointments in that place. Um, and sometimes people get their first appointments from uh, parties themselves. It does happen. I mean, I, my first appointment was from uh, uh, the parties. Uh, but typically, um, uh, people get their first appointments from institutions. Uh, and that's for, for a range of reasons. Firstly, it's the institutions that generally appoint uh, the arbitrators in small scale cases because there's, those are generally sole arbitrator appointments and that those are done by the institutions. Um, uh, and also institutions have a very keen awareness of the need to promote new talent and bring people through. Um, so they are the, usually the ones on the lookout for new arbitrators. They're also the ones who, who well, frankly, take a risk on some new people. Parties tend to be themselves tend to be very conservative in their choices. So they'll appoint someone who, who has a track record. Um, whereas institutions will, will appoint the very experienced people, but they'll also um, take, a uh, take a chance, is probably the wrong way of putting it, but they, they will, they will recognise new talent and, and let, give opportunities to new talent to, to bring them through. So really the best, the best advice I've always given to people is to get to know their local uh, arbitration institution, um, get on the local list of arbitrators. Very often, arbitration institutions have panels of arbitrators which um, you have to have some experience before you get onto that panel. But then they may also run a separate list of arbitrators for the people who have no experience at all. But the idea is then they'll give you some experience if, to, if you go on that list and then you in due time you get promoted to the full panel of arbitrators. So I, I, I do say to people, yes, get to know the local institution, get on that, that list, that basic list, and build up your experience that way. And once you've had one appointment um, or a couple of appointments, then you'll be able to transition on. Actually, in many ways, that transition is, is almost as difficult as getting your first appointment because um, the institutions will give out the first appointments but then once the next opportunity for first appointment comes up, they'll, look, they'll go to someone else. <laughs> they won't 
give people more or well, generally speaking that they, they um may not give people again points again and again to get you up the ladder and there's that awkward transition between getting your first appointments from the institution and then getting party appointments um, uh, and that can take a while actually as well um, so it's, it's not just about getting your first appointment but actually what you do you do with it beyond that and how do you develop your career as an arbitrator beyond that while on the subject maybe building a career the future how do you think arbitration careers will change uh, in the future and what what should or maybe could a young professional do right now um, to put themselves in the best position for the future looking ahead? It's very foolish, of course, to try and predict the future because it never turns out quite as you expect. Uh, but having said that, <laughs> uh, my, my crystal ball, um, I think we're going to go very much down a legal process line in the sense that um, the technology will become more and more important. It, it, it's already very important within arbitration. I can only see it become even more important. Um, and I think we will, uh, obviously we're using Zoom and other platforms at the moment for communications that will continue. We're using um, uh, document management systems to deal with the amount of evidence in arbitration. But I think the next step will be using platforms for processes um, so that arbitrations are conducted via a platform and that's that's starting now i mean i mean institutions are, are introducing platforms that you um use and, and follow through the arbitration via that platform so um arbitration arbitration lawyers in the future need will need to become very familiar with legal process even more so than now in the sense that they'll need to marry that up with knowledge of technology um, and after that, it's perhaps a relatively short step to having more sophisticated artificial intelligence embedded in those platforms. Now, none of us lawyers really are capable enough to understand the technology behind the AI, but at least we'll have to become very familiar with how to use it. So I think it's, it's important for um, young arbitration lawyers at the moment to keep an eye on what's happening in the legal tech world. Because what's what's at a development stage now will be part of their everyday lives in the future. So um, any steps they can take now to start to become familiar with it will put them in good stead for the future. Um, but beyond that, I mean, what's going to change in terms of um, other parts of an arbitration career? Look, I, I, I'm sure that arbitration will remain an important part of our lives. I'm sure it will remain an important part of international commerce. Um, I, I, personally, I don't think it will ever be replaced by computers because uh, the, um, there's a human element of it. I mean, we're always going to, it's always going to be about disputes between humans and that will require humans to resolve. Um, famous last words, of course, I mean, 10 years time, we might all be out of a job, but <laughs> that, that, at the moment, that, that's how I, how I see things panning out. Um, so the human skills are always going to be important to have. The awareness of how people interact, how people of commerce um, negotiate, how they uh, enter into contracts. I mean, they, they, these, the, the, the psychology of, of it all is, is also always going to be important going forward. Um, but now the other thing to mention is, is where, where should, should younger arbitration practitioners position themselves going forward in terms of law firms and, and, and whatever. Um, now, there's a few things, um, dynamics here um, that are really beyond the control of, a, of a, any arbitration practitioner. One is what will client demand be in the future and what type of client demand will it be? I mean, for example, um, investment treaty arbitration, which has grown um, considerably in relative terms. I mean, I mean, it's uh, in absolute terms. I'm, I'm not the, the number of cases is not huge, but in relative terms, it's grown massively over the last ten or fifteen years. Uh, is that going to continue, uh, or is it going to decline? Particularly if states start to move cases more and more into um, uh, court systems. And, you, and I know you've had a policy cast about this already. So 
uh, and someone will, has spoken about it with far greater authority than I. But one one possible avenue for it is that arbit arbitration becomes less important in investment treaty disputes, and therefore opportunity career opportunities for an arbitration lawyer in investment treaty work will decline. Um, uh, now I don't I don't know if that that's a, a possible path, but but. It, 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 well, it is potentially a way we might go. So um, that client demand uh, will affect you and affect the opportunities you have in, in your career. Um, the other thing is just the way that professionals develop, uh, sorry, professions develop, that um, big law firms may get bigger. We may end up with... Uh, like the big four of accounting we may end up with the big four of the legal world and um, you may find the most the best opportunities will be in those huge organizations or we may find that there's, there's a greater proliferation of smaller firms particularly as conflicts get worse in, in big organizations particularly as the tech enables smaller firms to prosper so the, the, there's that shifting around of um, the profession that's it's not in your control but you have to react to um, and the third thing that is outside your control but affects you is simple demographics uh, i mean the fact that there may be lots and lots of people in your in your generation working in arbitration I mean, back in the 80s uh, I, I wasn't around myself then but as i understand it there were just relatively few people working in this space and therefore um uh, it's a much smaller industry of course at the time as well but but, but still i believe there were far greater opportunities now of course it's a bigger industry and there are um uh, in absolute more terms more opportunities but the number of people involved is so much bigger um and so on an individual basis you you may actually have to have a considerable degree, degree of luck in order to get very good opportunities and that's again it's something that may well be outside your control so what you have to do is, is sort of position yourself to um uh, uh, so to take advantage firstly of changing client demand um i mean identify an industry that you think there will be uh, good opportunities for arbitration work for example um, you have to position yourself in light of changes in the profession so uh, identify a, an up-and-coming organization for example i mean there may be in your jurisdiction there may be a particularly good dispute boutique which at the moment may be very small but it might expand to be something very very big on the other hand you, you may position yourself to to join a, a huge firm because there is certainly a possibility that these firms like Denton's, like Norton Rose, et cetera, will only get bigger and they will become the equivalent of KPMG and EY in the future. Um, and then finally, you need to uh, position yourself in terms of demographics. Now, that's a very, very hard thing to do because that, that's, that's such a broad thing. Um, but, but it may be that you just have to think about, well, what are the areas that are becoming relatively overpopulated at the current time or what are the areas that are becoming relatively underpopulated at the current time um now so i mean i have no good answer to any of those <laughs> those questions i must say <laughs> having posed them i i can't answer them myself and i can't tell people what the what the right way to go is um but but there is there are choices that people can make in their careers and there are um uh, ways to position yourself uh, ways to react to developments in the world, ways, ways to react, uh, or ways to take advantage of the opportunities that come along and to put yourself in, in your position where you can find these opportunities in the first place. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, would I do encourage people to be nimble and to uh, keep an eye out for such opportunities. Um, of course, having said all this, there's the overriding point, which is it's your career and it's also your life. So you need to um, not only develop your, uh, the number of, your, develop your CV, but also you need to have a, a happy and fulfilling career. I mean, you need to 
um, it's not just about the money, it's not just about the fame, it's also about um, getting value on a very personal level out of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So it, sometimes you may actually be much better off sticking to the job you, you're doing at the moment, if it's a job that you love, um, rather than going for that opportunity on the other side of the world, which, which may make you unhappy. So um, it, it all depends. It depends on your personal circumstances. It depends on, on what makes you happy. Um, that was a very long, long answer. No, but I don't think not. I really got anywhere with it. Um, <laughs> This is, this is amazing. Those, those are my thoughts yeah. about the future. No, no, this is amazing. It reads like a step-by-step -step instruction on how to <laughs> succeed in the business. I'm afraid of putting it online now because uh, the competition will increase. Well, well, yes, it, it will and it won't. I mean, well, I mean, competition has increased amongst arbitration lawyers over the past 10 years. And that's for a whole variety of reasons. It has to do with the expansion of arbitration, the, the raising of its profile, the um, expansion of the law, for, law, sorry, of the law schools. I mean, there are mo far more law schools now who are offering arbitration diplomas or, or degrees. And then that has, has led people down the path towards uh, arbitration careers. Um, but there are expanded opportunities because the firms have expanded. Um, so that's one way of, of, of resolving. Also, the market has changed shape in different ways. So while, in, while there may be few opportunities, perhaps in most very popular places like London, th there are opportunities in emerging markets. I mean, in Nigeria or Saudi Arabia or Brazil, I mean, they, these are markets where arbitration is still becoming more popular and people from those, those um, locations may find it they're actually better off staying there rather than moving to New York or Paris or people from other countries may find that in the past they would have um, emigrated to London or, or at least spent a, a few years in London now they should go and work in Lagos or, uh, or in um, Sao Paulo or something like that so uh, it's about looking out for these opportunities and it's about um, uh, well not not losing heart as well <laughs> because the opportunities are there it's just they change i mean um as i say you can't step into the same river twice i mean you um if you look back on the arbitration world 20 30 years ago it's it's there are some similarities but it, it's substantially different what it is now and, and the opportunities available are substantially different and they will be different again in 10 years time or 20 years time so um in this sense um, the past is not a good guide to the future and, and I don't think that people can look back and say oh well so and so had an arbitration career in the 90s in this way and therefore I'll follow that path. I, I think you need to be more aware of the opportunities now and, and the way that the world has changed and, and um, uh, the direction you can go in now. The, the direction taken by people at Freshfields, for example, which is a very good firm, and it was, it was particularly good in the 90s. Um, uh, those opportunities may not be available to most people these days. Um, so uh, perhaps I should, I mean, uh, Freshfields is, is very good, and I'm not, not, so it's not meant to be a criticism. It's just historically, many, many people came out of Freshfields doing arbitration in the 80s and 90s. Um, and, and they still do. I mean, they're still a very successful firm in, in, in arbitration. But um, it, it, in the past, in 30 years ago, you might say, well, you want to have an arbitration career, get a job at Freshfields. <laughs> These days, you wouldn't necessarily say that. You'd say, go off and get a job with a big firm in Brazil or get a job with a big firm in Singapore. Or, I mean, I mean the, world, the world has changed uh, and it will change again in, in the future. Some of the most exciting jobs, I think, are in legal tech, and maybe that um, people, young practitioners now, who think, well, actually, the opportunities for uh, traditional career paths are, are few and far between uh, uh, for me personally, they perhaps should then go and think, well, what about the legal tech world? What about what's going on there? Um, I mean, that legal tech is still pretty nascent. Um, companies are being established and they're growing. 
and if you get involved in it now you'll be in there at the, at the ground floor and you could it could take you in some really interesting directions um, which wouldn't be like the traditional career paths or the career paths the, from 30 years ago be very, look very very different but they could be just as exciting and as successful as 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 those careers from people in the 80s and 90s then thank you so much for this this is so insightful and it's been great having you on you're welcome you're welcome thank you very much